Cool. Uh, hello, everybody. Welcome to the July Java User Group. Uh, I'm Dan. Jonathan's usually here with us too, but he's at a wedding in San Francisco this month, so he uh, he'd like to be here, but he isn't. This is just the slide we have every month. Um, make sure you pay your bill. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's been really good. No problems at all. Haven't heard anything from Judy, so we're, we're doing well. Um, we have a mailing list which are, where we announce our meetings every month. There's a Google Plus community that uh, we post you know, news and things to. And uh, we record all of these meetings. So uh, you can check, check them out online or send them to your friends. Or if you miss a meeting, you can go and take a look. Um, we also post all the slides on our website as well at uh, tjunk.ca, so if you want to get the presenter's slides and be able to click on links and things like that, you can go get them. I think we might be a couple months behind on posting slides, but we usually try to get them up there pretty quickly. Uh, all right, so the news that I found this month, uh, Oracle's very excited to release the new Java ME. Um, they're uh, realizing that people are having a lot more fun with small embedded computers and uh, they're supporting Raspberry Pi, they're supporting uh, ARM Cortex M3, and they actually have builds ready to go for this stuff that you can actually download from their site. Uh, traditionally, the Java ME platform's a bit, been very corporate, and it's been hard to get into unless you're Nokia, or, you know, it's, it's been a bit of a challenge to develop for, but it sounds like Oracle really wants more people to get into the Java ME space and play around with it. Um, it's still got the sort of old school CLDC, APIs, Java 1.3 style, but uh, it sounds like they're working on that too. And they've also released a new Eclipse plugin, and uh, Windows 7 is now an approved development platform for it, so um, hit their site, check it out, especially if you have a Raspberry Pi, you know, 25 bucks will get you into embedded programming with Java, so it's uh, definitely a fun thing to try. Uh, we had another Java exploit last week. Um, another uh, sandbox escape using the Java Reflection API. So if you're interested in that, just go to javazeroday.com, follow the links, so it'll explain exactly what the problem is. And uh, this, is, this bug is reproducible in the latest release, the update 25. So it's, it's out there. If you're running Java browser plugin, it's as scary and you shouldn't be. <laughs> um, so we'll have to have to see how quickly Oracle patches that one. Uh, there was a big Google announcement, I think it was, was it yesterday, day before, something like that? Android 4.3, uh, the new release of Jelly Bean uh, with a whole bunch of new features. And they also announced a new hardware platform, so there's the Nexus 7 tablet, which looks really cool. Uh, they've also done a bit of security work, things like that, so new Android. There's a big vulnerability in Struts 2, and uh, nobody likes to admit it, but there is a lot of Struts 2 applications out there. And if you're running one, it's probably vulnerable to this. It's uh, an arbitrary code execution because of uh, some not sanitized URL inputs. So, you know, malformed URL can actually run code on your server. So that's not very good. It's uh, it's definitely worth updating or just getting rid of struts if you're, I don't know. I don't know, I don't know how much it's really still in use, but I know there's a lot, of, a lot of struts legacy. One of the articles I read thought that that was the cause for Apple's whole developer site to be taken down. Yeah, they thought it was backed on struts, so. Uh, Glassfish 4 uh, got a shiny new website and uh, it's got a, a new release. And it's the official EE7 mm. reference platform. Uh, but I thought it was very interesting from Oracle that uh, they're focusing on Java platform and not actual server features. So there is this, this little phrase in the, uh, in the release notes that say, server features such as clustering are included in the release, but they may not function properly with some of the new features added in support of the Java EE7 platform. So they, they, haven't, they haven't tested clustering, they haven't tested server embedding, uh, a whole bunch of major features that you'd actually use if you were running Glassfish in a production environment. And uh, they warn you that they might not work. So 
I haven't, I haven't tested my stuff on GlassFish 4. We're using GlassFish 3. Um, so I don't know how well it works or not, but that doesn't give me a lot of confidence. Maybe the next, maybe the point one will be better, but <laughs> a little, I'm a little bit worried about that. Uh, conferences, lots of exciting stuff coming up. Uh, Devox just announced that they're selling tickets, so you can go to their website and if you sign up for uh, Devox Belgium, uh, which is a great deal. That's uh, a lot of conference for a very reasonable price. Um, and the other uh, Java Zone, Java One, they're also open for uh, for tickets. So uh, some of them sell out. Devox usually sells out. So if you plan on going, it's better to buy early. And uh, J Focus, I don't think are selling yet. Is so that's. Um, there may be. I think I don't think we've applied for it, but. Uh, if you're interested in going, let, let us know. Just email Jonathan or I and we'll poke to the jug list and, and see. They usually give a discount. So that's all the news I've got. Does anybody else have any other exciting Java news this month or even not exciting Java news? Anything? No? No? Okay. Um, so we've got uh, Mike Brock presenting his. Uh, JDK Java Strikes Back. Okay. Is, uh, let's go. Let's go. <laughs> um, so my name is Mike Brock. Uh, I work for Square. Uh, we're uh, uh, a fast growing company. How many people are familiar with Square? You know what Square is? Put a little reader in your thing and, and you can take credit cards. Uh, we're doing a lot more than that though and uh, talk about that later afterwards. Um, I want to go over a little bit of history uh, about Java just so we can kind of put some things in perspective like you know and, and kind of frame Java 8 and see where we are. Um, you know the first version of Java was released to the public on, on January 21st uh, 1996 and you know this we have some some nice timeline here. You can see in, in Java 1.1 that was when we first uh, introduced anonymous classes, reflection, RMI, G JDBC. Um, you can see that that release happened about a year and 29 days later after the first release in Java 1.2 uh, I don't know why Java 1.2 also says that it implemented anonymous classes, reflection, RMI, JDB. That's actually not true. Uh, but anyways, <laughs> um, Java 1.3 was, was uh, uh, introduced on May 8, 2000. Um, it was the first one to get the hotspot JIT, which, was, which is uh, really awesome. It's uh, the best JIT out there t to date in terms of uh, being able to efficiently optimize code and make it run real, real fast. Um, and that was, that was released a year and five months and one day um, after that release. And then Java 1.4, of course, came out on uh, February 6, 2002. It was released one year, eight months, 30 days later. And Java 5 came out and this was a big release. This, so this one actually took two, year, two and a half years, a little more than two and a half years to come out. But, it, but this, is, this was like really kind of like where shit got real for Java, right? You know, this was, this was like, you know, where we are today, really from like a language perspective. Uh, we have like, uh, except there was the, the nonsensical version version scheme change from uh, what happened to Java 2, 3, 4, uh, we don't know. Um, the uh, introduction of generics, of course, uh, as well as, as annotations, enumerations, uh, var args, enhanced for loops and static imports. Um, for most of us, these like language features are like very much now a part of our day-to-day -day life. Um, some people went kicking and screaming, but I think that's where we are today. Um, Java 6 came out, um, and it was, uh, you know, J Java 6, like, from a language perspective, was, was no different, right? It, it was the same as Java 5. It, it, had an, it had introduced a new compiler API, um, uh, which allowed you to do things like annotation processing and things like that, lots of fun stuff. And um, it had some performance improvements for Swing. Those are really like, kind of like the, the big big features for Java 6. There was also some other small API changes that aren't really worth talking about. But uh, Java 7, of course, came out. And this is, this is interesting because, you know, Java's been out now for like almost, almost uh, over two years now, right? And, uh, um, you know, this, I, I mean, I, I, how many people in here are using Java 7 today? Like three out of like, how many people? Um, you know, that, that's, that's sort of like, you know, what I normally 
uh, see when I ask people. I mean, the adoption's like really, really low. It's like, it's like maybe 10% of like people are like using Java 7 uh, today for like new stuff. Um, we're, I, I, I'm, I'm actually not using Java 7. I'm currently working on a project that's in Java 6. So um, I'm part of the, the, the bad people that aren't, aren't moving forward. Um, Java 7 introduced Invoke Dynamic, uh, which, is, which was a new bytecode that really was focused on supporting dynamic languages on the JVM. Things like JRuby and Groovy and uh, J, you know Jython and all those languages that um, they don't like to be type safe and so uh, they had to go through all these hoops to basically like work nice on the JVM they had to do all this crazy class generation and stuff and that was like very expensive and it led to like perm gen problems and all this other um, unfun stuff so they, they they tried to solve this problem with invoke dynamic um, they added support for switching on strings um, a pretty cool feature, a new file I/O API with like you know finally you can you can actually figure out like the the permissions on files or at least the Unix permissions and and uh, things like that. Uh, try with resources, so resource management was built right into the language um, to make it easy to close streams and database connections and. Um, also, uh, you know, they simplified the VARARG, uh, uh, the VARARG uh, syntax, uh, support for binary integer literals. Um, that's pretty, that's, that, that's ac that, that actually would have been very useful to me when I was implementing the WebSocket support in JBoss AS. Uh, underscores and number literals, so you can basically group numbers and actually, you know, easily see if it's like a, a million versus 10 million. Uh, Multi-catch, the ability to, to basically create catch blocks that can catch a intersection of exceptions as opposed to um, chain stuff. And so Java 8 is what we're going to talk about tonight. Um, there's really like, I mean, these are really, really like the, the, the four big uh, aspects of Java 8. Um, tonight I'm going to focus really heavily on lambdas because that's like where a lot of the meat and potatoes of Java 8 is. Um, it also implement, it, Java 8 also sort of implements the balance of Project Coin. Um, Project Coin was actually slated for Java 7 and some of Project Coin got in there and uh, that stuff has now uh, been slid all the way into Java 8. It also Im introduces this, this new uh, stuff called type annotations, which we'll briefly look at, and a new date and time API. Those, these are really the big features, but Lambda's a big one. So we start off talking about Lambda's by looking at our old friend, the anonymous, in our class. Uh, I think if anyone has written any amount of Java code, this sort of, of construct looks very familiar to you. Um, uh, so what you know? What is an anonymous inner class, right? It, you know, anonymous inner class is this. It's well, it's 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 this is this is what what it is. I mean, when you actually create one of these anonymous inner classes in this particular case, like a new runnable, um, really what's actually happening is the compiler is synthesizing this class. It's giving it a name. Uh, this is actually the naming scheme which the which Java C uses. It adds the first. The first anonymous inner class that it finds in this class called my class gets named mon uh, my class money sign one, and the second one gets named my class money sign two, and that's that's you know that's fun and exciting, um, and the the call site of course gets changed to to uh, you know instantiate that class that um, that it synthesized. Um, so. So then we get into situations like this where we want to like basically uh, pass pass, you know, state into this, this anonymous inner class. We want to use it like a closure, essentially. And so in this particular case, we're going to do some useful work. Uh, uh, we want to distribute gifts to these gift recipients. So we've all done this before. We marked that, that variable final, so we could, we could close over the, the, that variable and actually use it from what's inside this anonymous inner class, um, like so. So you can see that there. Um, and this is what it looks like when the compiler does this. If you've ever decompiled a, uh, uh, a Java application, well, or if you looked at the bytecode and actually see what it does, when it generates one of these classes at this point, when it sees that we're actually passing in this GIF recipients, it actually creates a, uh, a member of that synthesized class, my class money sign one, um, and it gives it like an internal name, uh, like money sign underscore one here, and it, cr and it synthesizes a constructor which it can use to pass in that uh, variable and, ca and capture over it, and then it rewrites the code there to use that captured variable. That's, that's how an anonymous class works in Java. That's how the, the compiler deals with it. Um, so Lambda. So um, 
you know, Lambda, you know, changes uh, this up a little bit. So here we have our, our, our method uh, that we uh, just saw a few minutes ago that has a, uh, that calls some executor um, and submits a runnable to it and calls our distributed GIFs method, wherever that is. Um, and uh, we've replaced it with a Lambda. Now, um, this, the, this, this down here is, is uh, exactly the equivalent, basically, in, in Java 8 to the above, but not really quite. Um, not, not exactly. Um, they're not just syntactic sugar on anonymous classes. Um, this, is, this, 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 this was actually um, a big argument within the Java community for a long time, right? There was a lot of competing uh, proposals for um, closures and lambdas. And it's important to know that that's, this actually is not the case. Um, these aren't just syntactic sugar. So there was a, there was a, uh, uh, a proposal put forward called CICE, which was like C-I-C-E, which was compact inner class expressions, which was essentially this, uh, essentially looked like lambdas do today, but they were literally just a way of, of expressing a, a, a single method uh, inner class in a concise way, but that's not what's actually happening here. Um, they're also not closures uh, because they violate some of the rules that are associated with that word closure. I mean, a closure like in computer science like literally means a, uh, a function that closes over the lexical scope in which it's declared. Uh, what that literally, like, I mean, what, what that literally means is, if it was a closure, in theory, you'd be able to access all of the locals and mutate on those locals um, from with inside the closure, no matter where in the application that 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 actual the actual handle on that closure uh, got retained. Um, it would bring that actual, like, it would, it would have to like retain the whole operand stack or you know, at basically, a, and all the other stuff down at a low level at that point, so it would be able to. Uh, work in that way. That's what a closure is. Uh, they decided not to go full bore on that uh, in Java. Some people wanted it, but that's not exactly what happened. Um, so uh, they introduced this concept called effectively final, uh, which was kind of their compromise b between uh, going full out with closures or uh, doing the uh, uh, going like the size model. Um, and you can see, so you can see here that, like down here, we have the the final um, on this declaration here, and that was meant to be animated. I, I, I when I did this, uh, when I moved over to this slide template, I didn't realize that it was going to change my animations around. So this is a little bit confusing for me. Um, so you can now see that we are now able. This is valid code, so we're now able to write this this uh, this method down here, do some useful work, and pass in the gift recipients, and not declare it final. Um, I probably still will decl declare it final because I like to declare all my variables final. But um, you, don't ha you, don't, you don't have to um, anymore. What happens now is the compiler d uh, calculates this concept of, of, of effective final. And I'll, um, I'll, we can take a look at, at what, that, what that means. So um, this is a perfect example of a variable which is no longer effectively final. So if you do this in Java 8, if you write this code, the compiler will blow up at you. It will, uh, and if your IDE is aware of the rules of the Java 8 grammar, it, uh, or it will also get mad at you. Um, it works uh, quite simply. Um, the compiler basically, as it discovers variables in a method, in this case, GIF recipients, basically processes the whole method and it looks for any evidence that, or, or well, it doesn't have to look for evidence, it, it's a, a discrete set of parsing operations and such. So um, it looks to see if there's a, a reassignment to that variable at any point uh, within, that, within, that, uh, uh, within the scope of that method. And if it does see this, um, then uh, it will blow up at you because well, you're not allowed to do that. You're not allowed to do that because they're not true closures. Uh, it still it still needs to basically uh, at compile time capture the state of those variables and cop. But they but it but it doesn't create an anonymous inner class. We'll actually take a look at that. I mean, it looks like a clever way of synthesizing anonymous inner classes. That seems to be like what what they're trying to do. Um, but that's actually not what, what they're trying to do. And I'll show you um, how they're not doing that. So. Lambdas work around this, co this idea of functional interfaces. So uh, functional interfaces have a few rules. So th things, things in Java 8, a lot of the interfaces that you work with today, 
will automatically be functional interfaces. You won't have to do anything to them. You won't have to add any annotations to them or add an additional keyword. Um, functional interfaces just are based on a few basic properties. This is runnable, which is uh, a very uh, well-known interface this, uh, in, in Java, um, is a functional interface. Why is it a functional interface? Well, it has one method, one, one, one publicly accessible method, and, and that's it. So that makes it a functional interface. That's, I mean, they, they, they were calling, it, I mean, there was uh, another way it was being described uh, called, they were called SAM types at one point, a single accessible method. Now there's, there's a reason why they stopped calling it that, and we're going to kind of look at, at why that is. But that's a functional interface. So um, this is where it kind of gets a little bit, a little bit interesting because a fu so, and this is where you'll sort of realize that lambdas aren't really anonymous in our classes. If you take a look at at the the, the uh, runnable interface, which I've put down here, and you take a look at those those uh, methods up there, um, you'll notice some. You'll you'll you might notice something uh, that I'm getting at here. Uh, where is this here? Here we go. Um, the methods have, all of these methods have this signature. And because they have this signature, it means that, well, we can do this. <laughs> so what is this? This, this, is, this, this, this is some crazy stuff. A lot of, if, you, if you haven't looked at Java 8, you haven't seen this before. So if we, if we could take a look back at, at what we just did there, um, You'll notice that we have a method called useful work method. It returns void and accepts no parameters. Another one called another useful work method. It, ex it returns void and accepts no method. But we also, and, and, and we also have this executor somewhere that accepts a runnable. Now, so when we do this in Java 8, believe it or not, this, this compiles and it actually works as, as, as you expect. So what this is basically saying is, uh, uh, for foo, uh, for for on the instance of the type uh, instance of foo, um, I want you to execute useful work uh, method as a lambda, and then I want you to execute another useful work method as a lambda. And because the signature of useful work method and another useful work method matches the type signature of the functional interface, you can actually use that method directly as a lambda. So. This is, this is where lots of magic happens. And so this is actually the first feature in Java uh, that, use, that requires use of invoke uh, dynamic. So this actually relies on invoke dynamic from an implementation perspective. So. The master name doesn't match. What's that? Runnable master name is run. Yeah, no, but, but so, so, so it, doesn't, it doesn't matter what the, the method name is. So execute accepts a type runnable. So executes, per, the first parameter of execute accepts a functional interface. And I've already said a functional interface can only have one publicly accessible method, right? And because it only has one publicly accessible method, um, what the compiler does is when I pass this, what's called a method reference to it, it looks at the signature of, that, of, of the method which I'm referencing, and it looks at the signature of the functional interface, and if they match, we can get together and sing. And so we can basically treat that as, as a lambda. Um, I'll show that. I'll, I'll, I'm, the name doesn't match. The name doesn't, so, so, so what do you mean the name doesn't match? <laughs> like you're saying because the method is called run. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't care. That's part of the uh, it doesn't see. Right? So, so yeah. So let's take a look at this. Um, uh, so this, th this, as I said before, this is a functional interface. So what the compiler does when it looks at this, it doesn't care about the names of anything. It only cares about the type signature of the functional interface. That's all that matters to the to the Java compiler. So the signature of that of that functional interface is that thing which is in the middle. That's the signature of the functional interface. And therefore, anything, any, any method that matches that signature can be used, can be applied against that functional interface as a lambda. And this is going to, this, and this, this, this magic is used to great effect in the next section. I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna show this to you. And this is something called streaming collections. And I think streaming collections are like the coolest thing. They're like, they, they're what, <laughs> 
um, they, they, they're what are going to take advantage of this really awesome feature that we just showed you about how we can use lambdas. And so this, this, is, a, this is a use of uh, streaming collections. This is real compiling code. And we're going to look at this. I'm going to have a short demo for you. I'm going to open up my IDE and we're going to write some Java 8 code. Um, and so what this actually does here is it creates a, a, a list uh, with two elements in it, foo and bar. And it calls dot string, dot stream on the Java util list interface, which is returned. Now, so all of Java's collection types from the in the collections library uh, support this now in Java 8. And so dot stream returns uh, our, our, uh, our basically our stream building interface. We pass dot map to it. Now map, so this is a mapping function. So what we're going to do now is we're actually going to map everything which comes through that stream, which is every element of the list, to that function that we've specified here. So this is lambda calculus right now, right? So um, like, like real functional stuff in Java. And so we're going to map it to the lambda string length. And remember what we do, and remember what we just like and remember what we just learned about right um, in the last section, because uh, you know because string length is base ha accepts the <laughs> matches the inbound signature of the type, it can be applied to that and be, I mean actually this is this is I need to show this to you actually in, in code um, and it's because <laughs> this one's a little bit more tricky to, to, to think about actually the, uh, the other the other example was actually much easier um, the next thing we're gonna do is we're going to reduce it yeah, I'm using a reduce function um, uh, starting with value 0 and, and using the integer sum and applying that and, and, and collating it now that's that's kind of a, 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 a month a mouthful which is why I'm going to open up my IDE in a second here. Um, streaming, co streaming, streaming collections, um, they support both laziness and e eagerness. So um, as the data is basically like moving through and like you're actually doing stuff with it, you can do both eager and, and lazy operations. So you don't actually have to fully, so th that's, that's a whole thing about streaming collections, right? You don't have to fully materialize them at each, at each segment of the stream because that'd be like, that could be like really, really expensive from a memory perspective. This is like, a, this is a very important feature of streaming collections. We're not simply creating a copy of the entire list ev at every single point and then copying it again and then copying again and then copy it again. Now, there's actually a, a real streaming thing happening. Um, and, because, and, and, and because of how they're designed, they're completely parallelizable, like right out of the gate. All of, all of the collections uh, streams can be parallelized, which basically means that we can essentially create a, uh, uh, a parallelized stream that will actually segment up the work using the fork join framework, which was introduced in Java 7, and uh, basically split the work of doing all these crazy operations across multiple cores. And so you get, you get multi-threaded stuff for free. Um, and I'm just going to show you a demo, because this is, this is fun stuff. So I got my uh, IDE uh, ready to go here. And uh, I got IntelliJ all set up and ready to use J JDK 8. And so I, I just, I'm just starting here with like a regular uh, demo main class. And uh, let's, 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 let's take a look at this, right? So um, let's, let's start off, like uh, we'll create a list. They'll say, you know, uh, Toronto, you know, Waterloo, San Francisco, three cities which are very much a part of my life right now. And, um, and let's, let's call dot stream. So uh, you'll, not you'll notice that uh, there's that parallel stream. That's what I was talking about. So you can just automatically take advantage of uh, multi-core. If you if, if if you're like trying to process a lot of information and you need and and you and your uh, work on the actual collection can be parallelized, and there's something called a splitterator, which we'll talk about, which or maybe we won't, depending on the time, um, that allows you to sort of set the strategy as to how the work will be split among different parts of uh, or different cores. So that's stream. So what can we do here? So we can do lots of cool things. So um, uh, let's let's say let's create a filter, all right? Maybe and and so what we want to do now is we'll create a filter that. What's what? Let me see here. Um, 
string contains uh, actually no I can't I can't actually do it like that I'm, uh, let me see here s yes uh, string contains space and then let's see and let's return a count on that so this is a perfect example of like how we can do like really fun expressive things. So there's actually one element in this collection that contains a space, and that was cases like San Francisco. That was San Francisco, and we did that by creating a predicate, which is this little lambda right here. Um, what else can we do? We can do lots of fun things. Maybe maybe we maybe we want um, all the elements that don't contain a space. And maybe we want to put them all into a new collection. So how would we do that? So let's create a new list. Uh, 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 cities without spaces. Let's create an array list like so. And after we filtered that, um, we can basically say, you know, for each of those, um, we'll do cities without spaces add. Like that, like so. Oops. That doesn't return anything anymore. But if we print out cities without spaces, you'll see that we now have a list that contains Toronto and Waterloo. And so this, so what happened here, right? Well, what, what happened here was um, we were able to treat the add uh, method of list as a lambda which matches the signature of this consumer functional type. So the, the consumer functional type here, we can take a look at the signature of it here, um, has a uh, single method except of the type that, of, of the parameterized type T. In this case, it was string because we, had a we created a list of strings. And because, remember this was your question before about like, about, uh, uh, names matching. Um, it didn't matter that the name add and accept didn't match. What mattered was that add accepted the signature of string and returned the, uh, and because it accepted that same signature, we were able to apply it onto this consumer inter uh, on this consumer interface. And so we were able to you know, n we were able to avoid even having to write any any code to like dispatch to that that method directly, and so you can do really really powerful things with this. Um, uh, you know, uh, I, I just showed you guys that, and, we, and, and and you can keep and you, and you can keep uh, uh, adding to this, of course, right? So uh, we want to filter each of these. Let's say we um, let's create a mapping function. Uh, we can map, I don't know, or we, let's, let's map it to uh, string.length. So when we do this, um, let's say, and for each of those, uh, we'll print system, or system.out.println. <coughs> So I want to. I'm going to end out printing on each line the length of each item. So seven and eight, and we had an empty list there. And we can go ahead and, and of course, say, say, and so if we go and add a, another city like uh, Boston, should see three come out the other side of the list. Seven, seven, eight, and six. So we so we're doing like real awesome lambda calculus now in Java, and this is this is this is really powerful stuff. So this is, uh, uh, you know, I mean, th th I mean, the one thing I want to say though about this actually, and I've been, uh, I was debating whether or not I should say it because I'm basically giving you a talk about Java eight and trying to like make it seem all cool, but I mean like this this obviously has a huge. Uh, potential for abuse as well, right? So um, there, there's lots of good reasons to use this stuff, but at the same time, if if you like find excuses to like litter your code with like lambdas and then put lambdas within lambdas and have those lambdas have lambdas with inside them, um, I'm going to hunt you down like the dog you are. Um, 
if I ever have to debug your code. Um, so, uh, you know, so does anyone have any questions about what, what I've just shown? Do you want to not understand what's going on? Yeah. How would you do something that, like, took two parameters or something like that? What's that? Would you be able to Yeah, of course. So um, it's a yeah. So it's it's a uh, it uses like it uses a uh, a signature match. So if the if the like, as long as the thing that you're applying against accepts two uh, par uh, accepts two parameters. Well, let's just let's just I'll just let's just try it. I like I like having uh, uh, audience-driven demos. So I'll, I'll create like my own little public static interface. Uh, I'll call it the, 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 the Toronto interface. And uh, we'll say it'll be add, to, add two numbers, like so. And it will, like, or actually, let's not call it add two numbers. Let's say do something with two numbers. Um, int A, int B. And now if I go down, go over here, and I create another class called, I don't know, uh, something. And I say, I, Im I go and implement uh, add, um, int a, int b. We'll just print it. We'll, wow, we'll return it. Why not? Why not? Return a plus b. We'll go ahead and we'll do uh, multiply int a, int b, like so. Now, if we go ahead and get rid of all this, let's see what we can do here. Let's go ahead and create a method that accepts our functional interface Toronto. And we'll print out the result of, uh, let me see here. What am I? Wait, 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 wait. I'm not thinking this through well. Um, so we want to, well, let's just start off by doing it this way. I got up really early this morning. Uh, so if we go ahead here and go something, uh, new something. And then we say accept something colon colon add. Like so. So now, yeah, this is what you would do. So then you would say do something with uh, one and two, or, or two and two, because these will have very different results. And we can print out that value. So if we go ahead now and go accept something with uh, multiply, we should. I'm expecting to see uh, my console is going to print out two and then four. <laughs> or, oh, 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 yeah, four and four. <laughs> of course. Yes, yes. Um, so yeah. So two, so two times five will be more a better. Better, better example. So you can see that it's it's there's no limitation on on the um, on the number of parameters that a, a, a function type accepts. And of course, we can also we could also implement our own, right? I mean, we, I've been showing you this feature. I can go ahead here and do this, like uh, uh, you know, a b, like so. And this one can be my divide function because it doesn't have a divide. I don't have a divide function to use, so I just implement it like so. Um, there, there's my there's my uh, my lambda. And so now we have seven, ten, and zero. Because two because two divided by five in integer math is 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 uh, zero. So that's that's, uh, that's any any more questions? No, no. Okay, I will move on. Um, so, the, so the last, so like the, the last, like like a uh, major thing that I'll touch on is uh, this concept of type annotation. So, um, up until now, um, you know, annotations have been 
uh, really, with, well, really with the exception of like a few things, uh, you know, like you could now, now you could use like you could use annotation processors that now run at compiled time and will blow up if you, uh, for example, in, in Java six. Uh, the at overrides annotation is and is very important. Uh, you can, act, if you actually uh, declare overrides on a method that's not actually overriding a method from a superclass or an interface, like the compile will actually fail. Um, so these are like these aren't these are more than just metadata. They actually cause annotation processors to run. Um, type annotations um, are annotations that apply to type signatures, not annotations that apply to like ne like not just like a class, right? Um, it doesn't just mean it's been declared on the class. It's actually part of the type signature of a declaration. Here's a perfect example. So um, this is a, this is the declaration of, of, of a map type and it has two uh, two interesting things here. In the generic type declaration here for the key, it, uh, which is a string, we are declaring this annotation max length eight. And for the value, which is an integer, we're saying that we have this at positive annotation on it. Now you can probably tease out what these annotations mean just by reading them, and that's actually that, that's actually kind of the point. You can see up front here that the integer is expected to be a positive value. Uh, and the string is expected to have a maximum length of eight, and anything more would be bad. Now, the interesting thing about this is with type annotation, with with type annotations, we have this new con we have this new concept of this checker framework, which is very similar to the annotation processing framework that allows us to actually apply these rules at compile time. So these two things I just made up, right? Um, they're not built into Java eight. Don't like download like Java 8 right now and like try to like use those annotations because they won't exist. But you can, but, but what you can do um, with these, and here's another example like not null, um, you, you can, now this, 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 like this is another, per, this is another example, like this is a type annotation and we can't see that because we can't see the signature um, of the annotation. I haven't shown you that. But these are things which will actually blow up at compile time. Um, I seem to be missing a slide. Um, I thought I had a bullet point slide of like all the weird. Okay. Um, reorganizing your slides at the last minute is a bad idea. So um, I'll, just I'll just describe what that bullet point slide said. Um, basic, I mean, basically you, you, what you can now do is with type annotations is you can essentially like create annotations that at compile time, the checker framework will call out to validation code that you can have run automatically just as a virtue of being in the class path. How many people are familiar with the annotation processing API? You don't know the annotation? Well, okay, maybe I should tell you about that. The annotation processing API was introduced in Java 6. Um, essentially, uh, when you run Java C, it uh, scans the whole class path for like uh, uh, meta INF directories in, in the entire class path and it looks for um, any component of the, uh, the uh, any, any component of your application that you're compiling that declares an annotation processor. If it finds one, it compiles it, loads it, and then puts all of the code it's compiling through it using this visitor pattern. And this is built into Java 6. And, you, and, 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 and whoever is using your, your code doesn't actually have to know about it. Java C finds it itself, just by the virtue of this meta, these meta INF uh, files existing. Uh, they're actually files in the meta INF directory. And so type annotations do the same thing. They have this new checker framework. So as, so what you can basically say is, is that when someone access, like, accesses my map dot put and they put something into it, the compiler will, just as it remembers the, uh, the, type, the types of, of uh, oh, well, the type parameters of a declared type, will remember that these type annotations were there as well. And they will give you, your code, the ability to sort of uh, take a look at what's being added and determine whether or not to fail at compile time. And so you can essentially make 
extend the type safety of Java into very domain specific stuff. And so this 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 is like um, there's like there's like very there's like at nullable and, and not null are, are examples of, of ones that will like be supported out of the, the box. I think there's like a, an at intern um, which will also be supported. But these are these are like a huge new feature um, in Java. And I'm pretty sure that like every framework and um, will be racing to take advantage of these things. And so there's also a new date and time API. How am I? F yeah, I'm about yeah, I'm about I'm about half an hour. Um, yeah, but I wanted to keep it I wanted to keep it short, right? Um, I didn't want to I didn't want to go on too long. I'm at about half an hour. And so um, it also has a new date and time API, which I'm, I'm not going to show. And uh, that's basic. This, this could use a whole presentation. Yeah, this could use this could this is essentially a whole a whole a whole presentation that I'm not gonna not gonna touch on. Yeah. It's 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 based on Joda time. Yes. So that's basically my uh, my distilled down version uh, of this. And so uh, that's you got to learn a little bit about lambdas today and get a little bit excited about that. Uh, quick half an hour presentation. And uh, that's my Twitter handle. And uh, Square is hiring. If you go to that, go to that uh, website. If you're uh, looking for a job, uh, please do. And uh, that's it for today. Thank you. Can you talk about how this is implemented? How is what, what have they added to the VM? What have they just found in any interesting ways to do it? Um, so yes, yeah, built on. So you're, so you're asking about lambdas. So lambdas are built upon uh, the invoke dynamic and uh, method handle uh, facilities, which were actually which were added in Java seven. Um, that's how they basically work. So, um, are you familiar with with method ha method handle API? Um, so meth the method the method the method handle API in that was introduced in Java seven is uh, sort of like a way of doing like function pointers like programmatically essentially in Java um, which was you know a, a very important part of how you Im you actually work with invoke dynamic in uh, in 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 the actual JVM so um, what the method handle lets you do is uh, essentially uh, construct a uh, like sort of, you know, basically constructing a, a, a reference for the JVM to treat as a uh, a free-floating like function reference, essentially that can then be invoked through the via invoke dynamic. So invoke dynamic invokes on these method handles, and that's how it then it uses that to dispatch to um, a target method. And so um, it takes advantage of that functionality uh, here. Uh, because, like for example, uh, I gave that demo where we called the method three different times. So, in older versions of Java, what you would essentially have to do is, um, you know, you you would you would if you wanted to like synthesize that sort of function. Well, first of all, you wouldn't be able to do it in the language at all. But if you wanted to synthesize that in, like, say, like something like Ruby, where uh, or JavaScript, for example. JavaScript's a great example because JavaScript lets you, uh, you know, uh, you know, essentially do like cr lots of crazy indirection. You can hold on to a reference to a function. You can pass a value, the, the, you know, a, a value that that holds that function to another object, which then like invokes that function um, as a value. And method, the method handle API and invoke dynamic together essentially let you do that underneath the covers in Java. Uh, or, or in the JVM, anyways, and that's so. That's basically how it's implemented. So when I so when I pass, for example, like you know, string colon colon length, um, that essentially causes the Java compiler to get a method handle to that method, which it then uses to attach to the thing it's calling, and then use invoke dynamic to make the dispatch. Uh, that's the easiest way that I can describe it. <laughs> Is a method handle really just an object with one method? No, 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 no. Um, no, it's uh, me method handle is like a basically a fully extendable framework, essentially where you can completely control dispatch um, the way that the JVM dispatches 
uh, uh, method method invocation. So it's not it's not cheating. It's like uh, it's a it's a new first class feature of the JVM to sort of uh, uh, do dynamic dispatch, which is which is what this is, and so and to allow and to allow that dispatch to to be controlled. Uh, uh, you know, to be controlled in like an arbitrary way, but that's that's how they that's how they've done this. Any idea why they left those closures up? So closures are a big bag of hurt, right? Um, uh, objective C is over time closures have helped simplify framework usage from the user's point of view. And I don't see that happening here if we don't have closure. Well, so the framework designer will have to get it exactly right. Well, so Java, so Java was designed in a certain way, and they created this this uh, um, the way they the, the way they decided to, to build this stack oriented J, uh, uh, VM, and uh, have all these crazy guarantees, which which lead to like a really awesome like debugging experience and such, meant that if they were to do like true closures. Um, it would be v it would be a very very hairy thing to do, like from a from the perspective of uh, of the VM, um, because you have to you have to think about like like what's 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 happening, right? There's like a there's like a, there's a call stack, right? And this the call stack is like you know associated with a whole bunch of like you know registers and 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 uh, local values, um, and if you close over that lexical scope, you have to take, basically keep a handle on that, like for like for now and forever. And in the case of, in, in, or at least until someone, and at least until no one is is referring to that lexical scope indirectly by holding on to an instance of that closure. Um, you know, I mean, there's a lot of questions as to like how you would even implement that properly in Java. Like, what would it mean if you called like if you did like new throwable dot print stack trace inside the closure from somewhere else? I mean, like, uh, you know, the, 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 there's there's really like kind of complex questions as to like what you would, um, I mean, how that would actually work. And I mean, they, I mean, there were people who wanted to do it, but I mean, it was just. At the end of the day, it just wasn't worth worth the cost. I mean, I mean, what? I mean, I think what they've done is like a really good compromise. I mean, allow it gives you um, a lot of the terseness um, that people wanted, um, and it provides uh, it provides the flexibility of of passable functions because you can pass these things around, of course, um, and that's that's a very big uh, a big advantage, but. Um, but being full closures, I mean, that's. I mean, I, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not really sure. Like, what advantage that you think that would that would add? I mean, I'm interested to. Well, if the if the framework designer hasn't designed the framework exactly the way you need it, and you need to communicate that to the original scope or something. So you're saying. Oh, you're. So they have to get it right. So you're. Well, you're saying that like if if, if like. Well, I'm, I'm, I, so you're saying that the using the closure as a way of essentially like like back end modifying state from the lexical scope that it closed over. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't, I don't think I, I, that, that's probably exactly what the, the Java language designers would want to avoid at all costs. Because that's just like on Java, right? You know, there's like, the, you know, I, I, I can't, I can't imagine that people like Brian Getz and and stuff would 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 consider that a feature. They would consider that like, they would consider that like a uh, uh, an attack on information hiding and uh, an extremely dangerous thing. Because using using closures as like a hack to basically modify things yeah, in the lexical that scope that it was that. Plan does closures. They're not. They're they're like little pens. The closures are intrinsic to lambdas. You can't do lambdas in any other language in the entire universe without closures. They're fundamentally related. Well, no. I mean, like, I mean, I mean, there, there are certainly limitations uh, uh, with uh, the lambda implementation. But I mean, I don't know what I don't I, I I don't agree that they're that they're fundamentally useless without without having the ability to close over the entire lexical scope. 
I mean, I mean, I mean, ja I mean, Java survived like you know decently well, um, uh, synthesizing most of the needed functionality with anonymous inner classes, and lambdas now add uh, more flexibility, the ability to uh, do true in true indirection based on essentially uh, function references that you can now pass um, in a type safe way. So I mean. I don't know. I mean, is, is there anything? I mean, what, what specifically do you? I mean, uh, do you do you foresee as like the pitfall of not of not being a true closure? You can only do very limited. Like, if you look at functions, closure or lambdas in Pascal or Scheme or any other language, the fact that they have access to the context, maybe they can modify, yeah. maybe they can modify, but they could make read-only closures, for example. Well, you can still close over whatever context you want. I mean, explicitly, anyways. You can always explicitly yeah, I mean, you could pass in state. state. And and if you, and you can you can close over whatever state you want, even with lambdas. Um, but yeah, I mean, at, at some extent, you can't like you you can't reach reach into and grab a local post hoc but like what why I mean how would that even be supported in, in, in a language like Java anyways like I, I mean like practically speaking let's say you don't close over like variable a and later on you wanted to to, to access like uh, a from somewhere else in the program that that has think, access what you do is every every scope but that includes a reference to the lambda that cares about the yeah closure. You create an object. And yeah. You put the variable in there. And yeah. References to it. Through the, through the object. That's easy to do. Yeah. But I'm trying to I'm trying to understand what the use case is though for not explicitly capturing. Like, what's the use case? Like from a from like a, I mean, what's? I create two different <laughs> functions that I pass around and do whatever with, but I want to parameterize them over different things. So I want them to have different. Uh, Context that they're executing. That's closure. It's a context for that lambda. Sure, sure. But you can you 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 can synthesize that behavior with not much work with lambdas. I mean, it's not. I mean, it, yeah. I mean, it's there's a lot of there was a lot of trade-offs there um, that they that they decided on. But yeah. Any other questions? Awesome, I'm gonna drink beer now. Awesome, thanks so much. <laughs>